Father in heaven, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that you love us. As Paul says, you know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because of your love for us. So, Lord, as we reflect on those words today and what we have for the message today, help us to remember that no matter what we do, you love us. We can always come back to you, always ask for forgiveness, and you are faithful to receive us, Lord. And we thank you for that, and we love you for that. Help us to get that message out to others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Yes, well, this week we are talking about humble love. Last week we talked about what Jesus was here for. He was fueled by love, and we went through John 3.16, that God so loved the world. This week we're talking about humble love. Next week we will be talking about... Uh, perfect love, and then the week after that, unstoppable love, which will bring us right into uh, Easter, where we then have the let's go look for a miracle. And we invite you to invite families with little children to come help me find a miracle on Easter Sunday. Uh, it's a lot of fun that we do on that day. Uh, it's sort of a tradition that we've been doing here at Highland Park Christian Church as long as years ago it was Pillar of Fire Church and uh, my father-in-law Bill Kruver used to walk the kids around and look for a miracle. We've had many people play Jesus over the years, many people play angels over the years and uh, this year uh, we'll see who we get but it's going to be a lot of fun and we hope you would invite families with little kids to come and help us do that. But it's even for the kids at heart, okay, because uh, Jesus died for everybody, amen, and rose again. All right, well, here again, uh, we are talking uh, about uh, humble love this week, and we want to remind you that it wasn't uh, the nails that held Jesus to the cross, just like it showed you there. It was love that kept him there, right? It wasn't the threat of the Roman legions or the hatred of the Jewish elite. It was his passion for humanity. That's why this is called passion and then the different types of loves that we're, we're going through. And re let's remind, her, remind us that Jesus gave up his life that we may have eternal life. And I know as church-going folks, we know that story and we've heard that story, but I was actually talking to somebody just yesterday that that story was new to them. Right? In America, people don't know that still sometimes. So we just can't take for granted what people know. So I think it's a reminder that when we're talking to people outside of the church, we shouldn't use church speak, you know. Uh, we should use, I'm not saying talk down to them, but I'm saying, you know, words that they can understand. And, you know, they, people don't understand grace. Quite honestly, I don't think most Christians understand grace, right? Grace is unmerited favor that God has given us because of what Jesus did for us. Anyway, so this is why I'm excited about this, and um, I want to remind you that it is blessed, more blessed to give than to receive. Paul tells us that in Acts, and he's actually quoting Jesus here. Uh, he says, "In everything I showed you that by working hard in this way, you must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Which makes sense because we're talking about humble love this week, right? And I'm sure maybe in your lives, you could think of a time where maybe you gave up something for somebody else or uh, and basically humbled yourself before that person uh, by doing that. Uh, so this is what Jesus did for us. He was actually the ultimate example for that. Matter of fact, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and you may read through that, I'm not going to put all the scripture up here, but he goes on in 2 Corinthians 9, and he's talking about generosity and giving, and basically the church giving to his ministry, which he then used to promote the gospel of Jesus everywhere. But he ends this chapter with John, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 9.15. And listen, look at what he says here. In 9.15 he says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And what is that gift? Jesus Christ, of course, right? The greatest gift of all time. It's the reason we have Christmas, the reason we have Easter, right? Jesus is the gift for all of humanity uh, that Jesus left his heavenly post to be with us. 
He emptied himself of everything. He was fueled by love, as we discussed already last week. But if love was the fuel, then there were also several additives present in the life of Jesus. And we're going to learn today, one of those irreplaceable additives was humility. Jesus was and is the humble king who serves a world in desperate need. I want to look at another specific passage of scripture here that helps us understand how Jesus displayed his passion for humanity while both on earth and at the cross. If you've got your Bibles, you can go to Second uh, Philippians 2, rather, 5 through 11, but I do have the New American Standard Bible up on the screen here for you. Let's read this together. You could read it into yourselves or read it out loud if you want. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in the appearances of man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross." For this reason, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because Jesus humbled himself someday, every name will bow. Confess Jesus as Lord, and every knee will bow. And as Christians, if we're saved, we've accepted our Lord and Savior as our Savior. But we want to let people out there know if they're not going to accept Him as Savior, then someday He'll be their judge. And they will still bow, and they will still confess Him as Lord. But it's better to have Him as Savior, amen? I mean, he's still Lord, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from that, but he is our Savior because he humbled himself. Now notice that Paul calls us on the very first uh, verse here, verse 5, he calls us to have the same attitude as the mindset of Christ, put that back, I'm sorry, verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves which is also in Christ Jesus, okay? He calls us to have that same mindset. I wonder how many of us have some level have a conditional faith rather than an unconditional faith. Okay? God, I'll go and do what you are calling me to do, but only if it aligns with my own priority. That's not the kind of love we're called to have, the kind of faith that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have unconditional faith. You know, Paul, more than any people and anybody in history, I believe, knew that more than anybody, because uh, he was, again, the Pharisee of Pharisees, right? He was the one who said, you know, I, I did it all. But he was also the one that wrote, I counted all as rubbish. And he wasn't saying that he was an evil guy sinning. He was saying he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. But that was rubbish. I think uh, the King James says dung, okay? He counts it as dung. Uh, that it's all as dung, But to know Jesus is the greatest thing. And so I think, though, that we kind of need to change our mindset sometimes. Now, how do we do that? Well, the, the great playwright George Bernard Shaw said, those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. All right, that's not in the Bible, but I think that's a pretty good quote, right? And if you're going to think like Christ and have the mindset of Christ, I imagine most of us here today need some fairly drastic mental reform, myself included. All right, thankfully, the Bible has very specific instructions and encouragement about the mind and thoughts therein. Once again, we can go to the Bible. Uh, we're going to stay in Philippians here, 4 through 8. It says here, wait a minute, is that 4? No. It's coming up. There we go. Sorry about that. Finally, brothers and four eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So often our thoughts wander off, right, into deep and dark territory. 
Anybody else been there? Or is it just me? You know, some, you know, you're going one way and you think, oh, gee, I'm not going to get out of this situation or the world's against me or whatever, or we're, you know, just not thinking the right thoughts. But Paul gives us the antidote to it. He says, focus your thoughts on the true things, the noble things, the praiseworthy things, the pure and lovely things. Not always hard to do around America today, is it? You know, maybe turn off the news. <laughs> okay, you know, get your news from uh, maybe AP. Don't look at the local news. The local news is most always depressing. Sometimes there's good things, though. Like there was a guy that flipped over in the L.A. River the other night because I thought the helicopter was going to land on our apartment building. I mean, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning. Anybody else hear that? Yeah, uh, but it was right here by the Sycamore Grove Park. And uh, and I really thought he was right outside our building. We we're going to land on the, on the roof there. But uh, but that was a good that was a good finale. They they rescued the guy, right? I'm sure he's got to get a new car now because it was in the river. But they did rescue him. Uh, however, most of the news is pretty bad. You know, people always say, you know, huh? well, if I don't if you don't watch the news, Harvey, how do you know what's going on in the world? I always go, well, I got people like you telling me what's going on in the world. <laughs> I know Bill Coover used to watch the news because he always said, you know, it's good because now I know who to pray for and how to pray. So, you know, if you're going to watch the news for that, okay, that's good. Um, but not just news. There's other things that you can really cut out of your lives. Uh, however, Paul tells us, you know, uh, rather than cut things out, just think about and focus on the things that are good, right? There's other encouragement that Romans 12.2 uh, gives us. Romans 12.2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. They're not going to give you the mindset of Christ. Indeed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind through the power of the Spirit, through the reading of scriptures and prayer. Then you will better know the will of God, and the will of God was at the forefront of the mind of Jesus Christ. Amen? How do we know that? We'll look at what he did for us. Matter of fact, if we go back to Luke here, Luke 22, 41 through 44, we're going to visit with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to see the kind of will that he had. Not his will. We'll see it's the Father's will taken directly from Scripture here. And he withdrew from them about a, hundred, a, stone, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. That's an amazing prayer, I believe. That's a prayer that I think everybody should say. Not my will, but your will be done, God. Send me where you want to send me. Mold me the way you want to mold me. Not the way I want to mold myself, right? Once, once we give up the God of this world, that is ourselves, thinking it's all about us, and we start realizing that we are just part of his story, history, his story, God's story, then I think that's when we get the mind and the attitude of Christ. Again, not easy to do. How do we do that? Bible reading. Fellowship with like-minded believers. Prayer, right? Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Why would an angel of heaven need to appear from him and strengthen him? Because Jesus knew what he was going, going to go through. And I believe he knew the physical pain that he was going to suffer. But I don't think that is what he was really concerned about. I think, and again, this is my speculation because the Bible doesn't say this, but I think the suffering that he was really going through was taking on the weight of the sins of the world for all eternity on his human body as, as God. Look what it says here in verse 44. Because he's in a human body and being in agony, he was praying very fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling upon the ground. It's, there's an actual medical term for this. For years, people thought this was just something made up in the Bible. And then we've seen people in history 
undergo this kind of psychological stress where the capillaries in their sweat glands break and their sweat comes out as blood. What this does, not only does it uh, make them look like they're sweating blood, it also makes the skin very, very soft. That means that Jesus was going to go through even more agony than we can imagine. And I, I don't believe God wants us to know how bad this agony was. Maybe, maybe someday we'll know. I don't know. But I know he's given us enough. Amen? He's given us a know, enough to know that he loves us. Right? And so here Jesus is. He's about to go through the most stressful thing that a human being can imagine. And yet he is saying, not my will, but your will be done. Now here's the deal, though. We can't all have this kind of humility. But you know what? Some acts of humility that we, could ha that we can have of ourselves are great examples of Christ living in us to other people. Again, we're going back to Philippians here, 2, 6 through 7. He says, Who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of God. Uh, the likeness of men, rather. He is God, born in the likeness of men. So remember, Jesus acted in humility in the most unbelievable way. He did not count his godly nature as something to take advantage of or hide behind. Instead, he willingly chose to make himself nothing by trading his godly nature for that of a servant. He acted in humility. He became human and was born into a poor family. And the rest, they say, is history. Amen. But again... As bad as this was for Jesus, I don't believe we could ever get to that standard. However, we can do small acts or even large acts of humility. Uh, I want to show you what C.S. Lewis said once. This, this is one of my favorite quotes. I'm going to read the whole uh, 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 paragraph to you, a couple paragraphs. But the last part is my favorite, one of my favorite quotes from me. He says, and this is C.S. Lewis. He says, Do you ever think when you were a child what fun it would be if your toys could come to life? Well, suppose you could really have brought them to life. Imagine turning a tin soldier into a real little man. It would have involved turning the tin into flesh. And suppose the tin soldier did not like it. <laughs> he is not interested in the flesh. All he sees is the tin is being spoilt. He thinks you are killing him. He will do everything he can to prevent you. He will not be made into a man if he can help it. What would you have done about that tin soldier? I, I do not know. But what God did about us was this. The second person in God, the Son, became human himself. Was born into the world as an actual man. A real man, a particular height, with hair of a particular color, speaking a particular language, weighing so many stone. He's British, remember? Okay. Anyway, uh, the eternal being who knows everything and who created the whole universe became not only a man, but before that, a baby. And before that, a fetus inside of a woman's body. Now here's my favorite quote. If you want to get the hang of it, think of how you would like to become a slug or a crab. That's what Jesus did for us, all right? That's kind of the way he says it here. That's the kind of humility that Christ had for us. And we're going to look at here another uh, an example of somebody in history. Anybody know who that is? I wouldn't expect you to. Uh, that is Vanderbilt, Alfred Vanderbilt. Okay, Vanderbilt, he was the great-grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, okay? Let me read to you here what it says. And I got this from uh, historycollection.com, 10 of the most heroic acts of self-sacrifice in history. Okay, so this is pretty heroic, what he did here. To say Vanderbilt was born into privilege is something of an understatement. His great-grandfather, Cornelius Vanderbilt, left school at the age of 11 and then went on to make a fortune in shipping and railroads. Cornelius left the equivalent of $150 billion in today's money to his son, who then doubled the family's fortune. Whoa. Okay, he had big shoes to fill. Alfred inherited this money, 
and fill him he did. For a while, he may, have been scand he may have scandalized polite society with his partying and womanizing ways. That's what this guy did. He was also, though, an astute investor, putting his money in real estate and, to a much lesser extent, horses. Okay. It was for the latter that Vanderbilt set off from New York aboard the Lusitania in May of 1915. He was planning on attending a meeting of the International Horse Breeders Association in Britain. Even though the waters of the Atlantic were teeming with German U-boats, most passengers on the huge vessel assumed that, since they were on a non-military ship, they would be safe. Oh, how wrong they were. On the morning of the 7th May, the Lusitania was attacked off the coast of County Cork, Ireland. It soon became clear that it was going down. Vanderbilt was, as a first-class passenger, given a life jacket. He gave it away. Then, as the ship started to sink, he continued himself with making sure as many children as possible got into the lifeboats. Now, given his status and given what had happened on the Titanic, he could have easily got a spot on a lifeboat himself and saved his own skin. However, he was still trying to save others when the boat underwent the waves. Vanderbilt's body was never found. A reporter in the New York Times noted that he displayed gallantry which no words of mine can describe. That's pretty humble. He could have taken one of those seats and, you know, hey, I got the money, I'm, I'm good. But, but he, did, he did the humble thing there, right? Stories of great humility always cause us to take a step back and offer our admiration of those involved. Obviously, the example of Jesus who gave his very life for those he loved st starts, uh, stands as the gold standard of humility and sacrifice. But maybe these stories are so striking because they're so rare. It's become almost unbelievable to us that people who would take time out of their busy lives to serve and love others, which is probably why Jesus told us to act in humility, to serve and love one another, and to give all the glory to God in the process. Amen? Humility is fundamentally about others. Here's another C.S. Lewis quote. It's not about less, thinking less of yourself. It's literally thinking about yourself less. Right? Focusing your time, energy, and thoughts on others. Becoming more we-focused rather than me-focused. Humility is so powerful because it brings, because being selfish is our normal operating procedure. Okay, yeah. I mean, first thing a child, you know, an infant does, what do they want? Uh, they want to be taken care of, right? Toddlers, you know, they, if, if it's my toy, it's my toy. If it's your toy, it's my toy, right? Some, some, some grown-ups even feel that way, unfortunately. That's why we have the jails filled. There's theft out there, and, there, and there's people that are just, you know, not thinking of others, but thinking of themselves, right? Jesus taught us to break the norm, being radical and, lo and love for others. It starts with how you think and grows into selfless acts of service for others, and it continues in obedience to the great calling of Christ in our lives. Now, I'm going to promise I showed you a, a clip here. Before I show you the clip, I'm going to give you a little background on it. Uh, Greg Laurie of the Harvest Crusade out in uh, Riverside, he's got the big Harvest uh, uh, Crusade that he does there, Harvest Festival, I'm sorry. Billy Graham did the Crusades. He, did the, he does the festivals. Uh, but anyway, he has the Harvest Festival. He was a man in his youth that was turned away from God. He lived in a trailer with his mother down uh, by the ocean. His mother was an alcoholic, a drug user. Uh, he had, and he saw many men come in and visit her over the years. Very sad story. But he was looking for something. And he found his way to Southern California, and he got caught up in the, uh, the Jesus revolution, if you were, the, the hippie movement that loved Jesus. Well, they started going to uh, Pastor Chuck Smith's church, Calvary Church in uh, Orange County. This was before Calvary was the big mega church that it is now. It was a small church, had a few people in it, and uh, it was Lonnie Frisbee that came in, and he was sharing the gospel with his fellow hippies that, uh, it's weird to say hippies in the year 2023, right? But this is what they were in the early 70s, late, late 60s, early 70s, and 
He invited them into the church. He didn't know what to expect. He's, you know, in, in the movie, The Jesus Revolution, Kelsey Grammer plays Chuck Smith. And uh, he says, you know, if I had one of those hippies here, I, I'd just love to talk to him about it. Well, his daughter brings a hippie home. He says, okay, Dad, talk to him. Uh, well, this was uh, Lonnie uh, Frisbee was from the Ashbury Park. Uh, not a, Is that the one up north in uh, San Francisco? Is that Ashbury Park? Yeah. Hate Ashbury. Ashbury Park's New Jersey, right? Yeah. Hate Ashbury. Okay. He came from Hate Ashbury. Uh, but he wasn't interested in the, the sex and the drugs that the hippies were. He found Jesus. And he was interested in sharing, filling up that hole in his heart, that God filled hole. Not with sex and drugs and crazy things, but with Jesus and tried to get that across to others. And he went to Chuck Smith and said, Hey, you know, open your church up. We, I've got brothers and sisters that would love to know what this is all about. Well, Greg Laurie found himself caught up in this church. And in one scene here, uh, the people were coming into the church uh, and with their bare feet. And the elders of the church had a meeting with Chuck Smith and said, Hey, uh, they're making our carpets really dirty with their dirty feet because they're barefoot. And he's like, really? You guys are worried about the new carpeting that we put in? We're trying to save souls here. But he says, okay, fine. Well, anyway, there's a website called Real and Real. It's R-E-A-L versus R-E-E-L to see which is true and which is not. And I couldn't find whether they verified that this episode shows up in real life that I'm about to show you this clip here. But I did find a message from Greg Laurie back in 2017, I think it was, long before the movie was made, talking about this incident that happened. So I think Hollywood did a great job of showing this. And so here, uh, again, the elders of the church are really upset because the hippies are soiling the carpet. Watch what happens here. And I want to turn this all the way up, Noel, because I don't think it'll work without it being turned up. And then close your eyes, Noel. <laughs> Isn't that a great clip? Yeah. Okay, I don't cry at movies, but that part made me cry. That was really cool. Uh, I, I'm looking at it now, and uh, actually, uh, how could it have been better if that elder would have stopped, pulled up a chair, and helped him, right? But what, what a selfless act there. You know, just doing what Jesus did. He washed his apostles' feet, right? And here are these for all accounts, grubby, no account people that uh, Chuck Smith went and humbled himself and showed the love of Christ. Again, not a big thing in the, long, in the big scheme of things, but it was important to that person, right? Each one of those people that were in line there. You know, it's a story of the guy walking down the beach and he's picking up starfish and throwing them into the water that have been stranded. And somebody said, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm throwing the starfish into the water so they don't drop, die. He goes, what possible difference could it make? There's millions of starfish around the world. He picked up another starfish and says, it matters to this one. And he threw it into the water. Right? Some of the small things that we do have big impact on people. I'm going to give you another clip from, a, not a clip, but I'm just going to tell you what happened here. It's from, from one of my wife's favorite movies. Uh, Lucy and Peter, and it's not, uh, oh, it could be uh, Narnia, huh? But no, this is Lucy, uh, the characters in this movie. It's from uh, While You Were Sleeping. 
Uh, Lucy says, you give up your seat every day in the train. And Peter says, well, that's not heroic. She says, it is to the person who sits in it. And this guy, Peter, is a very wealthy guy and uh, all-important dude in the, in the... And really, this is probably the only redeeming value he has in the movie, that he gives up his seat. But at least he does that, all right? That's a way of showing humility. So I think one of the most important steps that we can take as it relates to mirroring Christ's humility is the step of obedience. It's one thing to act in a humble way toward others. It's another to obey humbly before God. Right? Paul says that when Jesus appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Frequently, obedience may cost something while birthing something wonderful. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus going to the cross for us, right? Yes, he humbled himself. He did what God wanted him to do. But by going to the cross, by going to the cross, something wonderful happened. He gave the ability for all of mankind to be saved. To have that relationship, that restoration with God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? It really is. That's why we call Good Friday, Good Friday, even though somebody, somebody, some person with a capital P was killed on that day. One of my favorite BC cartoons is, I can't understand why it's called Good Friday. That was the day my Lord was crucified in uh, BC by Johnny Hart. He was a Christian. He says, and the, uh, I think it's Thor and BC are talking, and Thor, one of the characters says, well, how would you feel if somebody went to take a death that you deserved? He said, I'd feel good. He goes, have a good day. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and that's what Jesus did for us, that kind of humility. And finally, I'm going to end with Romans 8.28, and I don't have this on the... Do I have it? Maybe I have this. Oh, I do have it. Okay. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. All along, God was working in the life of Christ, right? The same is true for us. God is able to use us in every situation every frustration, every obstacle, every last thing for the good of those who love him. And as we learn to trust him, we learn to value obedience and faithfulness, which leads us to look more and more like Christ. And that's my prayer for you this morning, ladies and gentlemen. So let us pray in humility here. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness your graciousness and your gospel. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus was the most humble man ever to set foot on this earth, Lord. Thank you for sending him and setting the example for us. And Lord, we know we'll never come up to the, the magnitude of what Jesus did for us, but, but help us to remember to be humble daily in our lives, not to always want to win that argument, always want to be right, but to sometimes lay down our pride so that others can see you living in us. And then they can ask us, hey, what do you have in your life that I don't? And then it gives us a beautiful door to open the gospel and share with them. And again, Lord, uh, as we sing this last song, remind us to be humble before you and before our fellow uh, men and women. In Jesus' name, amen.